welcome to U.S. Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a marketing system to meet the needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. NFO represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. U.S. Farm Report now presents a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of our nation's outstanding leaders. Now here is W.W. W. Swaim. We're glad to have this opportunity to present to you some of the outstanding leaders of the nation. People that are scattered and diversified walks of life all the way from western Colorado east to Washington, D.C. and far north as way up in Wisconsin, down into Kansas, Minnesota. And today, we have with us Arnold Paulson, an outstanding young man from Minnesota who is doing a terrific job informing the public of what's really happening to rural America and to our economy as a whole. Arnold has been speaking throughout the nation and has studied the economy from one end to the other. Arnold, would you moderate this show for me today? Well, thank you very much, Butch, and it's a real pleasure for me to have this opportunity to be on your program today and to moderate this panel of distinguished Americans. We have just completed a seminar here in Sioux City, Iowa this past week discussing many of the economic problems confronting our, na uh, our nation's economy. And with us at this time, we have some distinguished panelists that I'd like to introduce to you and to express their comments. And I think to start our program out today, I'll call on Reverend Giles Ecola from Chicago, Illinois, who has been a past assistant for, the, uh, for five years to Dr. Mueller of Chicago. And at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Ecola uh, what your reasons were for attending this seminar or this conference and some of your observations. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Really, the churches and pastors in the denominations have a basic concern to relate to the American society and to seek to learn more as to what is taking place in all sectors of the American population and uh, the total American community. In the setting of the country, we have so much that is non-metropolitan in which takes place all such dynamic processes as the productivity of American agriculture and one of the personal concerns that I have is that uh, we tend not to know sufficiently the uh, productivity and the capability and the uh, quality of uh, our agricultural enterprise, and we tend not to know the issues and the concerns and the problems. I think that uh, in the um, very important and um, very large issues of the urban scene, we give a lot of attention to these, and uh, these problems and concerns uh, tend to get publicized in the various media of our society a great deal. Now, it would seem well that we, as uh, people of the various denominations who are concerned for ministering to the American society, that we uh, take and uh, examine uh, what is taking place uh, take time to listen. It's very important that we uh, spend time learning and not always uh, proclaiming without realizing uh, the um, social and economic setting of our proclamation. That little card just about fell over at the moment. Now, um, farmers and um, ranchers are a basic part of the American society, the American economy. And I think in the interest of wholeness, we in the churches, pastors and laypersons of varying assignments and persons of uh, varying responsibilities throughout church structures, need to listen. And uh, this seminar for me has been a time when uh, a lot of information and a lot of ideas and a lot of insights that I had not had the opportunity previously to become acquainted with in such depth. Uh, we're brought out in ways that uh, are very helpful, and uh, I believe that uh, we need to look at uh, the kinds of concerns that you men are working with in your seminars, and for this reason, uh, I'm real pleased to have been here, Mr. Paulson. Well, thank you very much, and we've certainly been happy to have you with us. Another guest that we have with us today is uh, Mr. Ellis Ketchen, uh, a farmer 
and also a member of the National Farmers Organization. And uh, he's been attending the seminar. It's been dealing mostly with national economics. But uh, Alice, as a farmer and as a person who's keenly interested in the conditions of our national economy as well as agriculture, I'd like to call on you to express a few remarks at this time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Polson. I think I'll go back to my local community to start with. I live in East Central Kansas and uh, live in a community that's uh, livestock, principally livestock. I, uh, I'm near the wheat belt and they lay, uh, uh, with a lot of grain. This whole area of Kansas seems to have one problem, and that is price, whether they're in the livestock business, whether they're producing grain. The price of wheat yesterday was $1.52 per bushel, which is approximately 50% of the true parity. Well, thank you, Alice. Did you enjoy the conference? Very much so. Well, thank you. We were certainly happy that you could attend it. I'm going to turn to the other end of the table at this time, and uh, this next gentleman is one that I've certainly enjoyed meeting. Uh, he comes from Colorado. He's a manager of the Production Credit Association, and I've found that he's a very uh, concerned American, uh, not only concerned about the economics, but also about the problems of his home state. At this time, Homer Jackson from Rifle, Colorado, I'd like to ask you uh, to express a few remarks uh, in relationship to your concern about the conditions of our economy and as a rancher and the conditions in Colorado. Thank you, Arnold. I uh, have gained a, quite a little from this seminar. I came back to Sioux City in an effort to get the thinking of others besides myself. I live in uh, northwestern Colorado, and as Arnold told you, I am with the Production Credit Association and finance the livestock and farm people in that area. We are primarily a livestock producing area of sheep and cattle, and as Mr. Kitchens mentioned, our problem there is price. Operating costs on the ranches continue to climb as costs go up in line with our national economy, except that the price of what we produce, our livestock, either is stays stable or our prices decline. And our ranch people are unable to show an operating crop. And in order to offset this lack of operating income, we're borrowing more money each year, and our loans are getting higher and higher. In fact, our loans have doubled in the past five years. Now, to make it possible to lend under those conditions, we've had to use the real estate as collateral, as a backlog of collateral behind the livestock operations. And up until this money situation tightened up and the interest rates uh, got higher, we were able to sell our ranches at about any time we wanted to and at, at attractive prices. But now we're finding that very difficult to do. In fact, real estate is almost uh, at a standstill so far as moving. We haven't dropped the price of it out there much, but you can't sell a ranch today uh, just when you want to. And uh, now we're up against the proposition of whether to operate for another year at a loss or just what to do. And <coughs> there in our area now, uh, we have more cows advertised for sale than any other time that I've ever known of, and I've been in the business for over 40 years, our livestock uh, operators are attempting to switch to yearling operations, or they're trying to get rid of this high operating costs, and they're trying to dispose of their base breeding herds. Now, what I'm interested in finding out is why our price 
is down when we're operating at a time when the demand for meat is, is at the highest that any of us have ever known in our lifetime. And we there feel that the price control of the livestock industry is in the hands of the retail end of the livestock business. We think that the retail end of it has, uh, they are the principal buyers, they have absolute control <coughs> over livestock markets. And they're setting a price for meat today, they're buying dressed meat today at a price by pound less than we sold live cattle for on the hoof 15 years ago. And while our prices have come down at the ranch level, the uh, operating costs have continued to climb during these past 15 years, and it's putting us out of business. We're, our experienced and capable men out there can't show a profit. It's impossible for young folks to come into the livestock business, the ranch, and on an ownership scale. And we see this thing absolutely going out of the hands of the farm people. And we're, we're really uh, in. Well, Mr. Jackson, <clears throat> a banker friend of mine in Kansas told me a couple weeks ago that a large commercial feedlot down there had just sold its, its livestock and they lost, I believe he said, $34 a head. How does this compare with the uh, profits and losses out in Colorado right now? Well, um, I've heard of reports that a computer study was run on the feedlots in Arizona and in northeastern Colorado, and th those reports bear up what you just said. They're taking losses there of 25 to $50 a head on all the cattle that go out of that area. And those are fairly efficient operations too, aren't they? Yes, they are. Uh, we were interested, quite interested, in a study that was made recently and published uh, by a Denver paper of the profits that were being made by the three leading retail outlets there in Denver. On these same cattle at the feedlots, we're losing $50 a head on. This uh, study revealed that the retailers were making a gross profit of as much as $188 a carcass on the same carcass that the feeder was losing $50 a head on out of the feedlots. In other words, as soon as it goes out of the hands of the farmer, <clears throat> the other fellow puts a price on it and gets the price. Yes, the, that's the way we see it. That when this, uh, our commodity, our fat lambs, now we sold fat lambs out there last week for as low as 18 cents out of the feedlot. And as these lambs and uh, fat cattle move out of the feedlots and go into the hands of the retailers, uh, they take these commodities into their hands. They apparently, without regard, spend as much as they like for advertising on them. They can uh, devaluate one commodity for the purpose of promoting the sale of another, and uh, then they take their markup over that, but they set a price to us that we can't live under. The feeder is under this dressed meat ceiling, and of course we're producers there in our area. We sell yearling steers, and we sell calves, and we sell lambs off the ranches. But the feeders can't pay us a price today for our cattle that will meet the cost of production. Well, thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> Jackson. It's been a pleasure not only to have you on this program, but to have participated on our uh, conference here in Sioux City this weekend. Uh, our next guest is uh, Father Dismas Treder, uh, Franciscan Fathers from uh, Pulaski, Wisconsin. And uh, Father Treder, you've traveled a long distance to attend this conference, and I'd like to ask you the same question that I asked the other reverend. Uh, what was your specific purpose in coming uh, to this conference, and what were your observations, or what comments would you like to make at this time? Uh, feel free to make any statements you like. I think it's important to demonstrate uh, the necessity of group action. 
I don't think that uh, our religious beliefs should divide us in an effort of the kind that the NFO is after, namely getting a fair price for the farmer for the things he produces. Um, myself, being a Franciscan, uh, a, a religious order man, have taken a vow of poverty, and as such, I may not possess money of my own. I have permission to use it, and certainly the vow th does not permit me from knowing something about money. We too have to live, we have to earn a living in order to keep body and soul together. We know that in the Old Testament as well as in the New, and I believe all churches will go along with this, that all workers are entitled to a just wage. There have been encyclicals by supreme pontiffs in the past about the necessity to get a just wage for labor. The last two also have included farmers, those who provide us with food so abundantly. But unfortunately, these poor people do not get the share that ought to come to them of the national wealth. There's much evidence that the farmer has been and still is getting the short end of the deal. We're certainly not asking for sympathy. You can't swallow that and live on it. What we're asking for is a just return for the effort the farmer has put in to provide food so abundantly for all the rest of the people in the country and also in foreign countries. There have been, as we know, a so-called new deal at one time. There was a fair deal, square deal, but all along, it seems the farmer was getting a raw deal. <laughs> What we're asking for now is a just deal. We're entitled to it. I'm a farmer myself, also a priest farmer, and uh, I'm just as much concerned about this as the other farmers. So the farmer is entitled to this, and I feel it's proper to work towards that end. Well, thank you very much, and it's certainly been a privilege for us to have you with us and to enjoy your fellowship during this conference, and we appreciate those fine words. Uh, the next gentleman I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm doing so with great pleasure and distinction. Many of you people who have attended my seminars throughout the uh, United States have often heard me remark or refer to Mr. Carl Wilkin, research analyst of the National Foundation for Economic Stability from Washington, D.C. Uh, I happen to be a student of Mr. Wilkins, and uh, I like to look at him as my professor in economics. Uh, practically everything that I have learned during the past several years, uh, I must credit to Mr. Wilkins, and therefore it's a great pleasure for me at this time to introduce him to you, and I'd like to have Mr. Wilkin uh, point out very briefly the specific purpose that he had during this conference in the presentation of the factual record of the United States during the past year. Mr. Wilkins is the uh, founder, you might say, or the author of the first balance sheet that's ever been made available to the American people on the operation of our economy. Carl, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, Arnold, I'm glad to uh, be here. And uh, my purpose was to point out to the seminar the importance of a balance sheet of the economic record as a guide for Congress in uh, restoring a sound and solvent economy. Now, in my presentation, I uh, pointed out that in the United States, from 1929 up to the present, we have the most complete economic record of the most complete economy that has ever been available to man. But for some reason or other, we have not used this record to set up a balance sheet to find out what happened in 1929, what road we have traveled since that time, and where we are headed. Now, in my presentation, I used a balance sheet using 4850 as a period of 100 and the 15 years that followed. 
In using it, I pointed out the operating loss of the United States, and in that period, the addition of $884 billion to the total debt, federal, state, local, and private, to offset the operating loss. Now, without a balance sheet, in the past 15 years, we have been operating on theories without any regard to facts. And uh, I use the balance sheet to prove that most of these theories aren't true, never have been, and never will be. And finally, I, to uh, having the atten people in attendance use a lead pencil and using their own arithmetic, pointed out to them how they could prepare a balance sheet of the economic record every year by using the President's economic report to Congress each January. And in using the 1967 report, which was published this last January, I pointed out that in 1966, the United States lacked 90 and 4 tenths billion dollars of having enough income to meet the wage and interest, the principal cost factors in operating our economy. And that most of this shortage was absorbed by a shortage of income for our system of private enterprise consisting of farm operations, small business, and corporations after taxes. Now, to offset this operating loss in 1966, we reached the peak in increasing the mortgage. When the Department of Commerce published its uh, debt figures in their May survey of current business, uh, I will predict that in 1966, we added $115 billion to the total debt. And this plus $884 billion means that in 16 <coughs> years, we've added $1,000 billion or a trillion dollars to the total debt against the economy. We we'll call it prosperity. That's right. And uh, we have passed this on to future generations, our children and great-grandchildren. Then finally, I use the... Uh, record <coughs> to prove how each state, by use of state records and the uh, uh, balance sheet, to determine the operating loss in each and every state. Now then, uh, I pointed out to them that it wasn't necessary that they had any training in economics, that all they needed was the record and arithmetic. And I think you'll agree that uh, most people know how to set up a balance sheet because they have to prepare their income tax. And in preparing their income tax, what do they use? They use their record and arithmetic. And uh, arithmetic is an accurate science. Now, unless we use a balance sheet, uh, we haven't any idea of what's going to happen. But because of this debt that we have added on, if we don't correct the balance, which uh, results from low farm prices, in turn a relatively low gross farm income, which is a source of income for rural America, we will duplicate what happened in 1929 to 32. Now at the present time, if that should take place, we have seven times as many dollars at stake and seven times as many financial obligations to repudiate. And I think you'll agree that that would be a pretty rough recession. It certainly would, Carl. Carl, I want to ask you one question. Uh, you used to live in Sioux City, didn't you, years ago? Correct. Uh, uh, isn't this where you got your start up in this area? Uh, I incorporated, uh, I was one of three men that incorporated the Raw Materials National Council in 1936. And the purpose of it was to prepare a balance sheet to find out why we had the depression following 29 when the experts were telling us we were never going to have another one. And I've compiled a balance sheet every year since that time. Well, Carl, uh, in, uh, in a very few short words, just what effect does uh, the gross price of agricultural commodities have on our national income? Well, the <coughs> record proves that from <coughs> uh, 1921 to 1952, for every dollar of gross farm production that entered our economic cycle, this newly earned income in uh, exchanging goods with industrial America 
generated $7 of national income. And in the period following 1929 to 41, all that was wrong with our economy was that we uh, didn't maintain the number of $1 flowing in to generate the income to consume what we produced. Well, who lost this? Uh, who, uh, who, who lost uh, uh, this income as a result of underpayment to agriculture? Was it just the farmer, Carl? No, the uh, entire country lost. And uh, the point I want to drive home is that if you do not correct the situation, <clears throat> you will continue to lose $7 of national income for every dollar that you underpay agriculture, and you will either have a depression or you will be forced to continue adding on more to the mortgage until finally the bubble bursts. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilkins. I see our time is running out. I'd like to uh, uh, once again see if these gentlemen have a concluding statement they'd like to make. Uh, in, in closing, uh, uh, Doctor, do you have a statement at this time? The only thing I would like to add at this time, Mr. Paulson, is this factor of uh, the importance of men in varying professions and occupations telling their story. It seems to me that quite often people in agriculture, farmer, farming and ranching, have not uh, spoken beyond themselves, and I'd like to ask them to speak beyond themselves. Well, thank you. Mr. Ketchum. Probably the greatest concern that's been expressed here is about our American system or low farm prices. All of these people are here on their own time, at their own expense. Some have come over a thousand miles, some 1,500, some 40 leaders in various groups and professions are represented here. Well, thank you. And uh, Mr. Jackson, again, I want to express our sincere appreciation for taking the time to be with us. Do you have a concluding statement? Well, <clears throat> I just want to say that uh, we as producers must uh, get a fair price or the production of our agricultural commodities will uh, seriously affect the uh, food supply of this nation at a time when, when it can't be uh, reduced because the population is increasing. We must produce more food and we must have a price if we are to produce it. And I see we have about 20 seconds, uh, Father uh, Treater. Would you like to... Just a few words. I, in order to get something out of an organization, it is certainly necessary to put something into it. Not just a little bit, but a whole lot. If all merely keep drawing out, soon there'll be nothing left for all of us li uh, to take from it anymore. Therefore, everybody certainly ought to put in all you possibly can, and in that way, the NFO will certainly be able to stand up to the other segments of the economy. Well, it's been a pleasure, pleasure to be on your program, Butch. Would you like to say uh, concluding? I certainly think we're living in perilous conditions in our economy. It's time that the farmers of America and real business people join together to solve this problem. We've found the answer. All we need is more people working at the situation, and it can be solved. It's through NFO collective bargaining for agriculture, American farmer, all types of farming. And thank you, Arnold, for helping me out here today. And I certainly do appreciate all you gentlemen coming this far to take part. And certainly, if we get the churches, the business people, and all of them working together, we will win. Thank you. U.S. Farm Report has presented a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of the nation's outstanding leaders. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of farmers. Music